finish up with that, uh, with the events that led up to the war. By the way, what was the myth that President Nixon so cynically used as the myth today about the generic name we give it for, the fact, or for this idea that North Vietnam was actually holding prisoners they never really talked about? Yeah, the MIA POW. And that was a pure myth. And but people now know it. You know, people don't know. It aggravates me, maybe because I, I hate Nixon so much. <laughs> I won't tell you a lot of the people I hate. Let me tell you other people I hate. <laughs> Still doing stuff. Why do you hate the computer? I'm nothing but nice to you. Computers for Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. It seems to be working now. And so, so I will post. So we got Monday and Tuesday, and there'll be a little bit of reading. I'm going to put it a quiz on that first little bit of reading at uh, Vietnam to Tonkin Golf, that first page and a half of that map, I'm going to put that on Teams. And what I'm going to ask you to do with the map, this is going to be a tough one, can you take a picture of that map and turn it in on Teams? The reason why is very simple. I kind of, I should have put it at the back. You can't rip it off because that rips off that, that, that page for you. Is that okay? If it's just turned in there, it is on Teams, yeah. Would you like us to make it a PDF? Yes, please make it a PDF if you can. Okay. Because team really slows down okay. if you use it. Um, you like Excel? Yeah. Would you mind telling them real quick at the end? Or? Yeah. Or you want to tell everybody right now? I can tell them right now. Does everybody here, I mean, this is me assuming you have an iPhone, but if you, you have don't, Your phone. You can also do it on notes. Can you? Yeah. I can like that. scan. This it. is the way I know how to do it. So you just select the photo. Um, you do this little like. The little box with the, the arrow. Yeah, little box with the arrow in the corner, and you're gonna press print. And then it's gonna come up with like a picture of how it's gonna look, and you're just gonna go whoop, and you just make a little gesture that's like this, like you're making it big. Try that. Like that. Yeah. Whoop. <laughs> do you have to make the sound? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It scans your notes as it save it as a, it literally says save it as a PDF. Mm -hmm. Wait, seriously? Yeah, so if you go to notes, I thought it was easier than my way. You like make a new note and then go to the camera and say scan documents. You like fold it over and then it oh, walks around it and then say keep scan. Oh yeah. And then save and then if you do the little box with an arrow, you can save it to your OneDrive and then make a folder for sample copies. Actually, I think that might be easier. If you go to notes and then scan the picture, it, it's actually pretty soft. I, that one works too, but this I think this one's a little more user friendly on notes. And then in Teams, it automatically gives you like uh, the OneDrive option. Oh, that's, oh, that's perfect. So go to the OneDrive. Oh, because I have to like browse for files just regularly. Mm -hmm. So it automatically just for buddies. Mm -hmm. Or you can. How about it? Um, we'll take a set. You can play with it, but yeah, the thing about it is you can save it as a PDF. PDF just open faster. Teams is such a quirky program that a picture slows it down so much. And it's not that it, it's not hard, but you know those kind of things where I gotta sit there and wait. And then everything takes longer. And then I get aggravated and give reports grades because I'm human. I would never do that to most of them. 
has always figured it out. Oh yeah, it's got little things where you can you can adjust the size of it. This is really going to be fun viewing for whoever's watching this. Well, we'll get to it. Let's come back to it. Let's finish this a little bit, then we'll take the last five minutes I'll to learn notes. How about that? I'll figure it out. Okay. So let's go and take your notes up there really quick. Let's finish up where we're at. What was the agreement? The uh... <laughs> It's actually, I, yeah, that's the thing. I, I looked at yours and I don't know. I don't see. I hit notes and get right to where it says take a picture. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. I don't. It, it worked, it, the PDFs are just, yeah. you know, it's, it's the world we inhabit. I was going to make you do something else or we could just grade in class, but since I have A days coming and then B day, and then there's what, four people taking a distant learning, it's just, uh, oh, please look at that, um, that summit to find someone to interview. And that was a really good idea with your, with your grandpa, right? Mm -hmm. And he, if, and he has passed away, but your mom knows. If you have something like that, that works a really good thing for you. That's, that worked out perfectly well. And we're going to interview two for 9 11, because today is the anniversary of 9 11, isn't it? And we are going to do that unit in class. And uh, it's kind of hard to do, because I vividly remember so much of this, and my own personal views come through and my feelings about what happened and the results of that come through. And it's hard to be objective, so I'm not going to be too objective. I mean, I was in that room next door, and we had the TV on. In fact, it was right before the beginning of first period when the first tower fell. And I was in another teacher's room, which is, <laughs> that teacher's retired, but now it's Mr. Solomon's room. It shows you how things have changed. And then I was in what is now Mr. Fukar's room. And we had TVs on the hanging in the each corner back then. It doesn't seem that long ago. It really isn't, but you guys were two years yet? About two years ago or one year? Hmm? It's 2001. No, I meant two years to go, two years before you were born. So what are you, 2002, 2003? 2003? Yeah, it's pretty, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about what happened, the plot, what Al-Qaeda wanted, where they came from, the results of this, couple of the conspiracies, which are, I don't even know what to say, conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to the Assyrians. Okay, so the thing about the Assyrians. That's what's so. Oh. <laughs> Cavalry, but they didn't have stirrups. <laughs> I was so confused. Think about it. How are you going to fight from a horse if you don't have a stirrup? That's a little lame. <laughs> You're never going to make it in the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tall. Yeah. Or you tie them on, or you slash out, or you fall off. Okay, so we're talking about West Berlin, the, the, the doctrine. The Truman Doctrine said every communist is from where? Russia. Yeah, they're all being led from the Kremlin. And I'll put the rest of this on the slide. I just want to get through a couple of things by this. But that thinking, the big thing about it is domestic politics. Once they said all communists are evil, and if we don't stop them in wherever it might be, from, from the Belgian Congo to North Korea, if we don't stop them there, we're defending the shores of where? Wyoming. Wyoming. 
who have no choice but to defend Wyoming. And so, a couple more things happen. Oh, what city, what city was the kind of the focal point? Could it be any city? West Berlin. And by the way, that statue, that's because my brother-in-law is a Berlin. He grew up in West Berlin. He used to climb, he would stand on a car over the wall and yell insults at the uh, East German guards so they pointed their machine guns at us. That's actually what I know. That's true. He's kind of a nut. <laughs> Still is. Yeah. My mom has a piece of the Berlin Wall. So do I. Yeah. Uh, uh, did she just, is just a piece of stone? Yeah, like, I guess they were just giving them away. Yeah. I have two, I have one just a rock, and then another one I bought. Yeah. Because there's only, there's maybe a mile of the wall left. And it's through one part of town, and they were going to tear it down for the re other re whatever reason they didn't. And it turns out now it's kind of like a little area of shops. Berlin's very wealthy. It's a pretty amazing place. And then there's one area that's about a quarter mile that's basically like a historical park. Where they have it exactly like the way the East Germans had it. Uh, they still have the, the towers and the chains where the guard dogs were and everything else. So it's all set up. Can you just get like killed if you went on the other side. If you're east, trying yeah, to go back, yeah. Yeah, no. yeah they would. They're all running away. That's another story. Okay. So Berlin was a key, but a couple things happened that would terrify the United States and the legacy would go on to the state. Truman Dr. Dead, we already mentioned about you know, Eastern Europe and all that. Oh, and then the Soviets, what made them so scary? Not just that they're communists, but what did they do? They defeated the Nazis. They beat the Germans. And if they could beat the Germans, there must be something about, something about this communism that makes them 10 feet tall. It's scary. And they must all be like, uh, uh, and they don't seem human, and they don't seem natural. In fact, I'm not going to watch a movie. So with that, a couple things are really quick. 1949. 1949. That those heady days of 49. Who won the World Series? James. Yes. Oh, really? Oh. Because they won almost all the World Series. Yeah. And that's all we need to know. And I hate the end. <laughs> Two big things happen, and they kind of change the world in this point of view. The first one will be codenamed by the United States, Joe One. Joe One, guesses? Yes, big hands. The Soviets exploded their first atomic bomb long before the United States thought they could. So now they. Okay, so the United States could always say, hey, you got this incredibly powerful land army, but we got the bomb. No, we don't have a monopoly. And literally overnight, people in the United States became fearful that waves of Soviet bombers would fly over and bomb the United States with atomic bombs. And people started building bomb shelters. Uh, I talked to someone who used to live in Conrad. And they talk about when he was a little kid, they would have these civil defense drills where he would help them set up a machine gun on top of a grain elevator so they could shoot at the Soviet bombers coming down. Now, of course, the Soviets did not have any bombers that could do this, but that didn't matter. Just tear. All of a sudden, now we're vulnerable. That's pretty scary. Well, we're not, you're scared. Speaking of September 11th, you know how that just made people absolutely terrified, especially areas outside of New York City. They just went nuts. And I remember people here talking about, you know, oh, we're going to get attacked next. It doesn't work that way. And they kind of shot their bolt doing that, okay? It was basically done. But that's another story. And then the other one. The victory of the communists in China, or as the United States, we call them Red China. The People's Republic of China, which is now this uh, authoritarian quasi-fascist country, but back then they claimed to be communists. Um, it's like super authoritarian. If you like your TikTok. So with that, Red China. 
And they won. They won the civil war in China, and the communists took over China. So now they have, by land area, the communists seem to control the largest country in the world, and now the largest country by population. And according to Truman Doctrine thinking, who's really in charge of uh, Red China? Russia. Yeah, Joseph Stalin in the Kremlin is leading this all. And this seemed to confirm to many, this seemed to confirm this concept of the domino theory. And this was a big deal. Because these were these two shots would lead directly to the fear of we are vulnerable and they're winning. And a couple things will come out of this. But first off, who was president of the United States when this happened? Harry Truman. President Truman. He was FDR's vice president. He's a Democrat. And the United States did give aid to the nationalist, non-communist government in China. But they were so corrupt, along with other issues, that they lost. They would flee to the island of Formosa. And today, that's what we call Taiwan. And Truman actually cut off aid because they were so corrupt. And this was in the end of 48. When the Chinese communists under Mao Zedong did their last offensive in the summer of 49, it was not planned to be a last offensive. There were only a few hundred thousand communist Chinese soldiers, Red, Red Army soldiers as they called them. The nationalist Chinese just collapsed. I mean, just boom, overnight, and was just gone. Took about a month and a half, just collapsed, and they all ran away. So it, the government collapsed. But what did Republicans do? They blamed Truman. They blamed Truman, and therefore blamed the Democrats. Truman lost China. No, he didn't have China to lose. But the point is, this is politics. Remember what I told you about domestic politics. Truman lost China. The Democrats lost it. The Republican Party was a much smaller party. In fact, many people thought the Republican Party was dead. And this would be the beginning of their revival. Because they found something they could hit Democrats on. You know, people love the New Deal, they love things like Social Security, but now we could say they're soft on communism. And you might think, well, wait a second, anybody this is what they say over and over again. They're soft on communism. You think, why Vietnam? This is it. Anybody who looked at this logically would realize the United States and Truman did not lose China. Truman was not responsible for an army of three million men to all desert at once. They were sitting there in the Blair House, because they were redoing the White House at that time. The White House was gutted. He's sitting there going, hee, 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 hee. This is my plan. It's ridiculous, but why do people believe it? They were scared. And why were they scared? Because of the Joe Because of Joe one. All those things added up, and one more big thing. Who scared him to death by saying the communists are ready to take over the world unless we stop them everywhere? Truman. Truman did it already. Truman and the Truman Doctrine said, the communists are ready to take over the world unless we stop them all over. And look what he did. According to him, he lost. Truman made it important. He shot himself in his own foot. Truman made everybody so scared. They're already scared. And then Joe won. Ah, and then this. Ah, Truman. And so what do the Republicans do? They hammer the Democrats. And what did the Democrats do? Including Truman. You're right. We weren't strong enough. And they begin this mass wave of rooting out communists. We're going to show we're tough on communists. Three months after, not even three months, less than three months after China fell in 1950 in Wheeling, West Virginia, Joe McCarthy. would give a speech claiming that there were over 200 members of the Communist Party in the United States State Department. Meaning, 
We have over 250 traitors in our government. And by implication, meaning Democrats. Meaning Democrats are what? And traitors. Remember I mentioned the stab in the back? Do you see why people were so willing to believe in 1970? This is the beginning of the Red Scare, the second Red Scare. They begin to root out communists. And what did, uh, okay. What Truman said, I'm gonna use a word. He said, he said, this is a bunch of bullshit. That's what he said. And yet he still bought it. He still acted like he bought it. He knew it was garbage. But they began to do loyalty oaths for everybody. The federal government demanded a loyalty oath for everybody who got a government job. That's quickly spread to state governments, local governments. If you work for them, you must give a loyalty oath saying your pledge allegiance to the United States. You're not a communist. Private companies began to do this. Places of business began to do it. You had to do a pledge to say you're loyal to the United States to prove you're not a communist. By the way, if you were really a communist spy in the United States and they said you had to do a loyalty oath to the country, what's the first thing you would do? Black. Yeah. I'm a, right, wouldn't you? You would say, I play, I care, thank God me, I'm a communist. No. It happened all over. 1951, there's this little thing called the Pledge of Allegiance. What did they add to it? To show we're not godless commies? Under God. Why? To show we're not godless communists in the middle of the Red Scare. After World War I, they added a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United they added of the United States of America. Before it was just Republic. Republics are the pledge was written to show all you know the best government that would protect all people, a republic, then it turned into just the United States, and then the under God. What would soon be added to money? It was already added to some, but it wasn't standardized. What would be put now standard on all currency and coins? In God we trust. Why? We're not godless communists. And this was all Cold War stuff. It just give you an idea of how just radicalized people came. So people are just going nuts. They're rooting out communists. People are losing their jobs. Uh, this was a time if you were a member of a socialist party, you'd be blacklisted and never work again in places like Hollywood and other places. Labor unions that had a number of socialists in it had to kick them all out. This was insanity. I mean, it literally became insane. This is the first time you start seeing the little lapel pins of American flags because you wanted to show that you were a true American. Which, by the way, once again, if you were anti-American within the country, wouldn't you be the first one to line up for a lapel pin? This doesn't root out communists, it just makes everyone conform. But back to this. That's why this is such a big deal. And so in June of 1941, did I say 41? I meant 1950. Okay, I just got what, the beginning of what war, or uh, of the wrong war. What war began? 50. 41. World War II for the United States. North Korea invaded South Korea. Most Americans could not have found Korea on a map. I should add, this was a legacy of the Cold War, too. Yeah. Okay, so wasn't North Korea, or like Korea, as it's known, was just one country, wasn't it? it under Japanese control. Yeah, it was South, a Japanese South, colony. South Korea was like, like the non-communist. So when the war ended, you're on the right track. Yeah. When the war ended, the, it was much like in, in Europe. OK, Japan surrendered. When, once the Soviets invaded uh, Manchuria, Japan surrendered. And the thought was, OK, now we have to occupy that. And so they just made a very arbitrary occupation line. A guy named Dean Rusk, who would become John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson Secretary of State, he just drew a line on the map, the 38th parallel. Just drew the line and said, the Soviets will occupy this area, the United States will occupy this. And the idea is someday they'll be unified after the war. So this was just purely occupation. Well, much like what happened in Germany, it became an area of confrontation. 
Austria was occupied that way too, but they became a neutral country and Austria was unified as one in 54. And so, in 49, the US left and left a really nasty dictator, Sigmund Rhee. The communists left the real deal. A tough communist fighter who fought uh, in, with, in China, fought and was trained in the Soviet Union. And, uh, Wait, What's that? When did the U.S. leave South Korea? Say it, say it again, Matt. When did the U.S. leave South Korea? Just a nasty dictator. We, we, his name was Sigmund Rhee. What? Oh, 49. Okay. And his great, great, the, the leader then, Kim Sun um, Il's great, great, great grandson is now the head of the They claim to be communists, but they're just ruthless dictators. Now it's a hereditary dictator with a huge army. But also, their equipment's off in the 1980s, so that's it. They invaded June 1950. Now, Stalin didn't disapprove. It's much more complex. But to the American point of view, when they invaded to unify Korea, who's in charge? It's all the Soviets leading this. And Truman decided, what does he have to do? What does he have to do? Or he will I think it was bad when he lost China. This map is kind of hard to see, but you can see it over here. Look at Korea. See Korea? It's pointed like a dagger. And they would, that's the term they use at Japan. And so if South Korea falls, according to the domino theory, there goes Japan, and then what? Just a hop, skip, and jump over the Pacific to Wyoming. And so with that, Truman felt he had no choice but to send troops, or he'll look soft on communism. And so there are troops in, in Japan on occupation duty, fat and happy and lazy on pretty cushy occupation duty. They got sent there to South Korea to stop the North Koreans. So we are now committing land forces. Five years after World War II, at a place most Americans could not find, and it had nothing to do with South Korea. Why did we do it? Because we have to stop the communists, and an American president did not want to look soft on communism. What's the biggest reason? Domestic politics. So what happened? Those first American troops arrived at a place called Taejeon right here. And what happened to those troops? They got routed. Just routed. And so then it became... Now we can't quit, can we? We can't quit. Well, North Korea, they all ran the supply lines. The United States were able to push it back. And then the US and South Korean forces went all, went all the way to the border of this brand new country called Red China, the People's Republic. And they entered the war. And so the US is going to fight China. Why did they enter the war? They said, we can't tolerate an unfriendly country right on our border. There's a logic to it. It's kind of, it's, the whole thing's insane. They pushed all the way back here. Eventually, we pushed back to this line right here, and they would fight three bloody years. Over a million Koreans would die. Over 500,000 Chinese soldiers and 50,000 American soldiers. Uh, the British sense of forces, Turks. This is a bloodbath. That's the border of Korea, to North and South Korea today. They did a ceasefire. They never had a peace treaty. So that's, there's still technically a war. The U.S. has 28,000 troops there to this day. And an error rate, about 90 points. To this day. But the point is, they entered a land war. A really bloody, nasty war to stop communism. Truman felt he had no choice. And he did it. And that's why this is such a big deal at this moment. He felt he had no choice. The war was not a victory, but it was not a defeat. South Korea survived. But once you set that precedent, imagine you're the next president and something like that happens. What are you going to do? Huh? Like keep holding that idea open. Because if you don't, what are your opponents going to do? bludgeon you to death. You're soft on communism. You're soft on communism. 
Democrats are really vulnerable. In 52, Truman decided not to run for re-election. The Republicans finally, like, the Republicans like, came out of the darkness. When's the last time there been a Republican president? Who? <laughs> Herbert Hoover, who lost in 1932. So it's 20 years of all Democrats. Democrats controlled the House and the Senate for the most, almost all those years, except for two. Except for that. They controlled almost every House, state house. I mean, the Democrats were on the ascent, and all of a sudden the Republicans are not 100%. That would really come in the 80s. But 1952, who's elected president? A Republican, a moderate Republican. A general, yes. Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican. And what did he use as his weapon? The Democrats of soft on communism. But here's the deal. If he comes in like that, what does he have to do? Doesn't he have to be tough on communism? And the thing about it is the communists are going to have what looked like a lot of victories. In the fit, well, Eisenhower's president. It seemed like it. Much of what is Africa began to decolonize, and they broke away, and some of them would be allied to the Soviets. You see the same thing in the Middle East. Uh, all right, let this map up here. 1956, Hungary tried to break out from Soviet domination, and the Soviets brutally crushed it. They did the same thing in East Germany in 1951. Brutally crushed it, and the United States didn't do anything. In 1957, what did the Soviets launch? What's, they launched it. Yeah, the first, wasn't that a good satellite? You feel like you were there? <laughs> How big was Sputnik? It was kind of like basketball, right? Yeah, about that big. Oh. Had a little shortwave radio that beeped. So it just went over, beep, beep. Which is Beep. And it, uh, um, but if you can launch a satellite, and you have a rocket that can get out of the atmosphere, that means you have a rocket that can do what? Attack. You put a nuclear weapon on it, fly it over the Arctic, and hit the United States. And no guy in a, no guy in the grain tower in Conrad's going to be to shoot it down. How long do you have? If it's what's it the Soviets? There's no Soviet Union anymore. But the Russians still have a thousand ICBMs. How long would it take to reach the United States? Not long. <laughs> Thirty minutes. Yeah. That's just enough time to. Yeah. Okay. So. But you get the point about this, the world is much more scary. And even though they look like a chance for detente, detente's out of peace. What country in 1959 fell to a socialist revolution and soon they became communists? 90 miles from the shores of the United States. Cuba. Sputnik and Cuba when the Democrats came back to the office, when Democrats ran again in 1960, by the way, 1960, who's going to be elected president? His vice president is LBJ. John Kennedy. And what did Kennedy use against Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon, who ran against him? The Republicans are soft on communism. The Republicans have allowed them to take Cuba. The Republicans have allowed them to get missiles that could destroy the United States. So while Eisenhower was president, now obviously we can't go through all the details. This is such an amazing time. It just fascinates me. I think it's just, it's so cool. And I'm doing the very brief, really quick history. Some of you might remember bits and pieces, but I know your mind still isn't quite into it yet. And also, there's a lot of stuff in there. But during that time, during the Eisenhower administration, there was a colonial war that the United States got involved in. A war of a colony trying to break away from its uh, imperial masters. 
a colonial war. A colonial war that actually began uh, 40 years before it started, or, or before the United States even got involved. It started before World War I. The US got involved in 54. Actually, even before that. Anybody know what colony I'm talking about? French Indochina. French Indochina. And those who are fighting to kick the French out and have an independent country just happen to be of what ideology? They were socialists. And that became part of the Cold War. And that brewed up for the United States in the 50s. And then in the 60s, here comes Kennedy coming in office saying, I'm going to be tough on communism. And what's he going to have to do? Be tough on communism. So we're leading up to the Vietnam War. And that is a shockingly good place. I think I'm done, right? We're going to have a little more. Good. Good place to go. That was a lot. It's amazing how much history I've covered. I didn't even mention Iran. We got through four of the lyrics. By the way, you know what happened in Iran? Iran got a democracy. Iran got a democracy. And the United States overthrew it. Why the U.S. overthrow it? Like a little we claimed they were communists. And also they had oil. What replaced that? Horrible dictator and eventually revolution. I wonder why Iran doesn't trust the United States. We did the same thing in Guatemala, Indonesia, Syria. I'm sure that has no effect today. The Congo. All these things are happening. Iran's a big deal. That would lead directly to virtually every problem in the Middle East. But we're going to get to Vietnam. We are going to do a little bit about the French, and then we're going to watch a movie called The Fog of War. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. It's fantastic. And y'all, I've been showing this for all the classes all like it. So Aaron, if you talk to Anna, I'm sure she'll remember and really like it. Oh, I'm sure she will. And I don't know how I'm going to watch it. I don't think it's on internet. I don't think it's on Netflix. For that. I know it's not on Amazon because it, was, it won the Academy Award. I think it won three. Yeah, what's it Fog of War. I have the DVD. I used to have a, a, a version of it. <laughs> Somebody powered it and put it online. But the copyright people got it. And so if it's on there, uh, I can show it in class and I can stream it on Teams. But it, it's. We'll see. Okay, figure out notes right now. You can't leave if you talk about it. Uh -huh. Updated, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those ones we just kind of play with it. Yeah. Okay. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out.